Hello. Welcome to this session. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to have all of you as participants here. Um, I'd like to introduce our, um, our speakers today. And we're going to begin these glasses. It's a terrible thing, you know. You can't see with them. You can't see with them. Uh, our first speaker will be Sabir Mansouri, and he is the founding director of the Institute of Religion and Civic Values. This is a non-advocacy research institute dedicated to improving coverage of world history and world religions in America K through 12 education systems. And this is done through analysis of history, social studies, curriculum, stand and standards, development of supplemental material, excuse me, material and teacher training. The organization's mission is to address issues of faith, citizenship, and pluralism, with particular focus on questions of religious liberty, religious pluralism, and religious literacy. He is also the founding director of the Council of Islamic Education, which conducts research on the media, educational policy, and political discourse related to Islam and American religious pluralism. And he'll be giving our first presentation. I'll go ahead and, and introduce um, Christine now, too. Christine Talbot is assistant professor of women's studies at the University of Northern Colorado. She received her PhD in history and a, and a certificate of graduate studies in women's studies from the University of Michigan. Dr. Talbot's academic interests include feminism, queer and post-colonial theories, US women's histories, the history of sexuality, and Mormon studies. Her current project examines the national controversy over the practice of plural marriage in the 19th century of Utah. Um, so will you please welcome our guests, and we'll take it from there. Thank you very much. Uh, every time I come to this part of the United States, especially Salt Lake, uh, uh, it, it really becomes an extremely important part of what I call my long 50 years of American journey which began before I came to this country. Uh, and uh, the journey culminates in a, such a very special place, if you will, and Salt Lake has that in my heart. Um, I began to work with, uh, uh, with Elder Oaks uh, from, uh, I think, 1995. Um, and last 16 plus years of our relationship has really taught me a lot. He's my teacher, he's my elder, and um, I've learned a great deal from him. I spent better part of my day yesterday with him. I was fortunate to have dinner with him. Um, and I'm bringing this up uh, because it, it provides you a little bit contextual aspect of my bringing the issue of the coverage of our two faiths in our public school textbooks. Um, my daughter, uh, who now is married to a Catholic, uh, which uh, among Muslims is a little question mark as to how can a Muslim woman marry a Christian or how a Muslim woman can marry a Kitabi man, as, as we would use the word, a Muslim man can marry a Kitabi woman but not so uh, for the Muslim woman to marry a Kitabi man. Um, so these are kind of challenges that we have to face as we embark on our own journey, as my journey has begun a very, very long time ago, uh, well, before I was born, actually. Much closer. Yeah. As uh, I grew up in a Sufi household where my father had decided at my birth for me to come to the United States and so he decided what I was going to do, where I was going to live, how I was going to spend my lifetime. Uh, and he did decide, and I'm glad he did what he did for me. Um, the, my daughter reading me her social studies textbook back in 1989 when he, she was in sixth grade uh, changed part of my life um, and brought my study of American education system uh, to where I focused on 
from that day on uh, in K-12 of our public school, Lorena. And she shared with me uh, a textbook, which I will show you the, the, example, uh, the image of that particular textbook uh, in a few minutes. Um, when I looked at what uh, she shared with me, uh, her social studies sixth grade textbook, um, when I left all of my businesses and established an institute, not to lobby on behalf of Muslims, uh, but rather establish an institute to take our place at the American table, if you will. Invited uh, scholars uh, uh, to provide me scholarly input in order for me to take that input to the publishers and others. Um, and as I began to work in 1989 and then finally established an organization called Council on Islamic Education, which uh, allowed me to work full time with the help of one particular businessman who funded uh, my work for the last 20 years until at least last year, and I'm on my own, uh, which is another challenge that uh, I have to face now. Let me begin with um, uh, the coverage of Mormons uh, 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 in our K-12 um, public school textbooks uh, where we teach about cultures and religions and history and civilizations, if you will. Much of my time I've spent not so much the coverage of uh, only Islam, but coverage of all world religions dealing with the publishers uh, uh, in a particular way. Uh, they had relied on us, of course, the coverage of Islam, more so than anything else, as I could not speak on behalf of other faith traditions. But our expertise of state standards and constitutional language is what we were using in order to frame the other faith communities um, and their presentation and the content in the textbooks. Um, my, I, have, I was traveling last few weeks uh, abroad and I had asked my staff to at least do some research as I had not actually very closely looked at in last few years uh, as to what has happened with the coverage of Mormon uh, civilization and otherwise in our textbooks. So these are some of the images and some of the examples that we were able to do research in last few months where staff was able to collect. And so let me walk you through very quickly. Um, as you can see, the, the trend um, in this uh, slide, um, general trends of early 80s uh, to now. Um, the, before 1989, actually, to be exact, uh, when the state of California has adopted the social science framework, um, before that, uh, in the early 80s, we did not have uh, what is called standards uh, and or framework. And so the examples before 1989, uh, the textbooks and the coverage of religions was not based on, um, it was based on curriculum but not based on state standards, which really allowed uh, the breadth and depth of the coverage of religions to be included after 1989 in California in 1990 and after 1990 uh, all over the United States. Here are some of the images. Uh, much of the images that you see in the slides are from US history textbook because that's where the history of religion centers and the uh, presence of the coverage of uh, historical aspect of uh, Mormon belief and the history enters. So. Here's a westward expansion, for example, is covered in one of the textbooks. Um, before 1990, um, you had very little, uh, you had some examples, but m much more so after 1990 because the the state standards specifically required. In some cases, perhaps, there was a better coverage before. In some cases, better coverage after 1990 because state standard then standardized what 
to be covered and what not to be covered. And later on, I'll show you a couple of slides as to what the state standards had actually had done. So here's, uh, and I'm not going through details of it, I'm just giving you a, a sort of an overview or quickly images of uh, some of the illustrations that appear in some of the textbooks. Here's the uh, one example uh, which is, uh, um, which was not later on adopted by this uh, state. You have the regional history that is covered, the so Western expansion to regional history, to the culture. Uh, when it comes to belief, um, general belief of Christianity is covered in, with a breadth and depth, but specific denominational aspect of Christianity is not very much covered in detail. So it's a general aspect of beliefs that you will find that is covered because in K-12 arena, where the sixth grade is where teaching about world religions takes place. And the sixth grade students don't have that much uh, of the time to study religions. And so you have a very o sort of a brief overview of the beliefs that comes. But when it comes to culture, and when it comes to the historical aspect of it, you will find a lot more coverage uh, between sixth and the 10th grade. And of course in 11th grade in uh, US history textbooks. So here's 1990. One, Glencoe, uh, that covers the religious uh, reform and second great awakening uh, example there. Here's another one uh, Hoot Mifflin has covered in America will be setting far west. And so you can see the pattern of how the, again, westward expansion in another uh, textbook where Kingdom in Utah in Cordes and Mark is where Mormons and, and then of course their uh, belief uh, in some ways covered. And here's the examples of beliefs, but again, uh, you will see the, uh, questions that if you can read uh, will be ref in reference to what happened to Mormons. Um, the students will have an, uh, at least some understanding of what had happened to historically and why. And these are the student activities uh, in um, Holt Reinhardt Winston textbook uh, uh, that uh, questions are there uh, about Great Awakening. Uh, Here's another example. Uh, A uh, uh, little bit more narrative uh, that you will find the coverage of that uh, in, uh, again, in reference to uh, the Western westward expansion. In some cases, we found contextual, perhaps, details uh, where questions are asked of the students and they have to do some research on what they're studying. Um, there's another one. Uh, in grade eight uh, in the year 2000. Uh, well, the multiple learning styles, uh, so it's more of a critical inquiry ways of bringing certain aspect of uh, the um, ways that the students can explore. So there are, there are different methodologies that uh, of course the textbooks are using allowing students to explore more than what the, what the, the, uh, the brief content that they may be uh, reading and studying and uh, giving them a chance to perhaps uh, do a more exploratory understanding of it. Um, again, uh, heaven in desert. What we have found interesting enough uh, that before 1990, the general trend of coverage, and I'll show you an example of my daughter's example as to how the, the religions were covered before 1990. Uh, what we have found is that the negative aspect of the, what I consider as edi editorialized or secularized version of the coverage of religions that you found before 1990 
that has changed. So now what you have is that more, because the state standards demands from the, uh, uh, from, uh, from the publishers to cover the religions um, in more of an attributive language, meaning that as Christians believe, teach about Christianity. So this is about rather than teaching. So teaching about religion takes place. And so you have a better coverage now because now instead of secularizing belief and or watering down belief, you actually have to teach the way believers believe in. And so as Christians believe, as Muslims believe, as Jews believes, as Hindus believes, is where beliefs of those faith will enter in the classroom uh, in much more clear way, uh, having a little bit more deeper uh, and the breadth and the depth will be there of the coverage of those religions. Um, just a few words about the state standards. As you can see in this case, uh, that the Utah core curriculum, by the way, in state standards, as you can see here, mentions they explain the reasons for the Mormon migration to Utah, explore the pattern of Mormon settlement through the West, recognize how the Mormon pioneers' heritage influences Utah today, and investigate the contribu contribution of Utah's new pioneers, that is ethnic culture, multicultural, religious, scientific, technological group. Now you have, uh, at least in Utah's case, Utah State Standards, uh, that gives a very clear indication as to what should be covered. And based on this standard, the textbooks will have to adhere to these standards and bring uh, the standard-based content into the classroom. This is in California's case, by the way. California does not mention Mormons specifically except one place, as you can see. Um, the first great awakening and second great awakening, uh, but it doesn't mention specifically about the coverage of Mormons. So state standard sometime expands and sometimes contracts in, in terms of what would be covered. Uh, and this is where I think educators will have to take a look at how the state standard movement has begun. One, two, how to participate in the state standard, uh, 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 when the state standards are uh, formatted, uh, state standards are developed. The communities can certainly participate and, uh, and educators' participation can perhaps influence the coverage of uh, or the development of the state standards as it, it, as it uh, works out in each state. The, what we found that uh, the trend, based on the trend that the context, the tone and religion and figures and qualities, all of those things have changed now. So compared to what was before 1990 and what it is today, uh, because of the state standard movement, because of the constitutional language that allows us to teach about religions in, in, in our K-12 arena, you have a much better way of bringing the, the depth of the content into, into the textbooks. Quickly, this is the, my daughter's textbook, uh, 1989, when she was in the sixth grade. And uh, uh, what Charles Haynes of First Amendment Center, senior scholar, has coined the term that we had in the early history of the United States, the classrooms where we taught religions. Uh, he called it uh, a sacred classroom. And much of the history of the United States, when religion was taken out of the classroom, he uses the term naked classroom. And after 1990, the term is civic classroom that is used for a class. This is an example of naked classroom. And here's how it worked. The, as you can see, the uh, 450 pages of sixth grade social studies textbook, there's a section called religion. Uh, out of 450 pages, the, by the way, the height of the study of world religions for students graduating from high school, 
this is all they will learn about all the world religions. In before 1990, guess how many pages were devoted to four religions as they are mentioned? How many total pages do you think will be covered through the section called religion? Any guess? Ten? <laughs> True, it was less than 10 pages on coverage of four religions. Uh, so let's look at those four religions. The lesson one, religion in Japan. <laughs> what religion was that? <laughs> Buddhism. Buddhism is not mentioned. But the title of the, uh, the section is religion in Japan. Lesson number two, religion among the Bedouin. What religion would that be? Islam, but Islam is not mentioned, but the title of the uh, section is Religion Among the Bedouin. So this is what my daughter was asking me, uh, are we Bedouin? <laughs> so there are 1.3 billion Bedouins around the world, I guess, and we have to learn about their faith. So the title of the faith is Religion Among the Bedouin. Now interesting enough, the number three religion, as you can see, is religion in France. And what religion is that? <laughs> So Catholicism was taught, but not in the United States, the most sec one of the most secular country in Europe, uh, is how we taught religion of Christianity, if you will. Christianity is not mentioned. Religion in France is how it was taught. And each, if you look at the pages of it, you know, two and a half pages or two pages on each religion, and much of it is pictures, very little content. And this is the height of all the knowledge of the world religions you would have back in 1990. This is why we are, at least in that respect, we are religiously illiterate. And uh, I would love to talk to Steve Prothero tomorrow as he has mentioned that in his book. Let me move on. I wanted to uh, bring up one particular textbook image just to give you an idea. Uh, seventh grade textbook ba based on the new framework State of California adopted back in 1990 had um, quite a long coverage of uh, history of Muslims and belief of Muslims, more than 50 pages, as State of California requires two years of, of history in the sixth and the seventh grade. Uh, and that particular textbook had seven images uh, of what is called moment in time. In each section, in, in this case, for example, in the section of Japan, you have a moment in time that comes alive in the form of a picture. The next one is in section out of Africa, uh, the Congo King picture. Um, next one is uh, on European history and crusade. And, and then, uh, again, uh, continuing with Parisian market woman image in one of the textbooks. And of course, the section on Islam. Um, <laughs> what is wrong with that? <laughs> the others were all? People. They were all human beings. And so this was, and I did ask them, 1990, uh, when I had a meeting with the Hut Mifflin executives, I said, why did you choose camel? So he looks at me and say, it was interesting statement, you people, and he starts out with that, you people were great traders, and the trading tool of the time was camel, and therefore we chose the camel to represent that part of the history. So I said, well, thank you very much, we appreciate it. It wasn't the camel that did the, cam the, the, to the, that did the trading. <laughs> and so here's what happened, by the way. Well, uh, they didn't listen to us. They, they gave us a contract to actually redo the whole book, not just that. This is just one example I'm sharing with you. And we did commission uh, an artist and came up with an alternative picture. And as you can see, a Bachelor scholar has replaced the camel. So you, you can take your place at the table uh, and, and uh, you know, can contribute in, in major ways. And this 
these are some other examples of coverage of history of Muslims. In general, in religion, in U.S. curriculum, as you can see, um, and this one, I mean, we, we spent several years, and this is the only study that exists in the United States. We compiled all 50 states' requirement of teaching about world religions through their state standards, and in one form or the other, all 50 states do mandate teaching about religion. This is the only study that exists of all 50 states, and it was co-published by, it was our document, our, our study, and it was co-published by Count, uh, First Amendment Center, Constitutional Center in Washington, D.C. And here's what, in, in this study, that I wanted to share with you uh, as to how the state standards reflect uh, and where teaching about world religion, world religion takes place. The so primary and elementary grade, you have a diversity studies, civics, U.S. history, and selected world cultures. In middle school, you have world history, world geography, and world cultures. And in high school, you have world and U.S. history, in, uh, and then U.S. and modern world history, and language art, fine art. So there are several different places where you have a coverage of world history in different form will appear. These are a couple of things that I um, wanted to put it in front of you. Teacher's Guide to Teach Religion in Public School it was published by the First Amendment Center, and we were one of the uh, partners who had uh, uh, helped uh, put the content together. Similarly, uh, uh, teaching about Bible in public school. It's, this is the publication that teachers use uh, in order to teach about uh, Bible using constitutional language in public schools. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and uh, these are some of our publications to supplement teaching about world religions uh, that uh, How do I stop this? Uh, I'll, I'll just stop here. Uh, and if there are any questions that I can answer, let me know. Thank you. Is there much, oh boy, is there much controversy in the uh, American Islamic community about what belongs in the textbooks? Do you find you have to negotiate um, among the, the tribe or the members of the tribes to come up with some kind of consensus? Well, it's a good question. Uh, knowing that was going to take place, uh, what I had done was invited uh, some of the most senior, most scholars, uh, uh, mostly professors and scholars of Islam, uh, t 10 or 11 of them, who became the affiliated scholars of the, of, the, of the institute. And so that allowed the community to understand where the content was coming from. So they represented all the schools of thoughts they represented all the different uh, ways, uh, interpretation and what have you, Shia Sunni scholars. So the body of scholars allowed me to have the credibility. Uh, second thing I did was that I made it clear to communities uh, where I spoke and where I communicated to them that I am not representing them as a constituency in speaking on their behalf. This is an institutional work Certainly, the benefit will be there for them as well as the others, but it was not on behalf of the community, and therefore, that issue did not appear in any way. Can I follow up with another one? Uh, are you consulting in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> I understand, but the, the, there's a major, you know, the, I'd have no um, on the ground knowledge about textbook problems over there, but the reverse problem of having um, texts over there that talk about Christianity or mm -hmm. Judaism or other religions in a way that might be shallow or 
deprecatory. Right. I've not uh, done that. I have gone to Malaysia twice where I was invited to study the Malaysian education system. I've done that in Pakistan, for example, where I was invited uh, to study, uh, essentially study, not to, not to advise them because I'm not in a position to invite. And I've done in different countries, but not in Middle East. Uh, um, where I'm invited, I go, uh, but not, a, a, not a, as an advisory body, but sharing the experiences of what I've learned. I've done the same thing in Bosnia-Herzegovina twice. The Grand Mufti of Bosnia had invited me because one of the publications that I shared with you called Emergence of Renaissance, he's been using it for many years to teach his college students to, uh, European history. And so uh, on his insistence, I went there, and I did spend a good amount of time to look at the, their education system. And I did uh, spend some time with educators there. And so these are the some small experiences I have. I've spent much more time in Europe, actually, uh, visiting more than 14 countries uh, and sitting down with educators uh, uh, around the table and sharing with them. Because I'm, I'm making it very clear that I don't represent, I don't speak on behalf of Muslims. I'm not a scholar. But I represent a, a scholarly body, a scholarly uh, institute that has a, taken a place in the American education system. And these are the experiences that we have gained. So contextualizing in that respect of what, what it is that I have done and uh, sharing that information many times has helped uh, educators from what I understand, what I hear from them, that they have benefited. Yeah. Could we, um, I was thinking just uh, to make sure we give Dr. Talbot enough time. It's interesting, I, on, I work on institution level, so I don't get involved in the local level. There are organizations, uh, CARE and others who are a grassroots based organization, and they do play a role. When I'm, when I'm invited to advise uh, in any, any cases, I do uh, advise them, uh, making it very clear that my advice is not based on representing their voice, but rather what I've learned. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, the, as far as the the specific issues, there are places where parents may have concern. I mean, the, the textbook example that I shared with you, the camel, uh, that textbook was actually, a uh, parent had filed a lawsuit against that textbook uh, because the coverage of Islam was not accepted by the uh, community in California, and they filed a lawsuit against the textbook, and of course the lawsuit was thrown out. And that happened, so much of my conversation that I, I share in that respect, that these are the things that are based on state standards. These are not things based on uh, organization that went in as a lobbying organization to change the content, but rather uh, as a partner, an equal partner in terms of bringing the issues based on the constitutional language as well as based on the standard, state standard requirement. You know, that's where I, I, I place myself and, and I don't, you know, uh, go out in, in public square arena, which is where not which is where not what I work. Okay. And we can take additional questions after uh, Dr. Talbot's finished. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. And I want to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak. Um, so what you'll hear today is part of my larger work about the national conflict over plural marriage in 19th century Utah. Um, in that larger work, I argue that, Mormon, that Mormonism offended anti-Mormon's very sense of the meaning of America. The practice of plural marriage meant for anti-Mormons, quote, the utter destruction of the home circle. And the practice of theocratic government meant that Mormonism, quote, cannot ex exist in contact with Republican institutions. In anti-Mormon terms, nothing could be more oxymoronic than a Mormon American. In this paper, I'm going to examine some of the strategies anti-Mormons use to demonstrate Mormons' un-Americanness. I show first how Orientalist anti-Mormonism de deployed Orientalist images, analogies, and allusions to manufacture racialized difference between Mormons and true, I'm going to use scare quotes a lot, so watch for them, true Americans. 
Second, I show how anti-Mormon metaphors of, of and anxieties about Mormon contagion rendered Mormons a danger to the American body politic that must be contained, if not entirely cut off from political influence. Orientalism and metaphors of contagion articulated for all Americans the marital and political boundaries beyond which they could not go and remain truly American. The making of Mormon difference presented for all to see the conditions under which an American faith and the Americans who practiced it became radically foreign citizens out of order, a danger to the republic that needed to be purged from the body politic. Early anti-polygamists relied on orientalist metaphors to establish difference to establish difference by linking the Mohammedan practice of polygam pol polygamic theocracy to the Orient, a term which then referred largely to the Muslim world. The discourses that identified the Mormon community with the Orient did so within an, within an inherited context of European colonialism that was certain of the Orient's racial, intellectual, cultural, and political inferiority. Orientalist metaphors accounted for deeply rooted structures of marital, religious, and political authority that anti-Mormons found anti-democratic. In the context of European, Orient, of European imperialism, Orientalism framed the paternalism of colonialist power in constituting the Orient as a backward, underdeveloped, and in need of the civilizing influence of European rule. In anti-Mormonism, Orientalist tropes facilitated, facilitated the explanatory triumvirate that connected Mormonism's peculiar marital practices, religious authority, and theocratic rule and placed Mormon polygamic theocracy within an emerging 19th century discourse of race and racial difference. For anti-Mormons, Orientalist metaphors illustrated the Mormon betrayal of religious, marital, polygamy, sorry, religious, religious, marital, political, and racial legacies of America. Early Orientalist anti-Mormonism depended in large part on the emergence of Orientalism in the context of European imperialism. Edward Said's groundbreaking work, Orientalism, argues that in the late 18th century, Orientalism emerged as, quote, a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. For Said, the 19th century Orient was a figment of the Occident's imagination that took its power from its ability to categorize, abstract, and make manageable vast regions of local particularities. However, for Said, Orientalism served not only to define and codify the Orient, but also to refine and delineate an essential identity of the West. Orientalism set all of that which was seen as characteristically Western over and against the Orient, a kind of residual category into which that not Occidental was placed. Orientalism, quote, was ultimately a political vision of reality whose structure promoted the difference between the familiar, Europe, the West, us, and the strange, the Orient, the East, them." Close quote. Now scholars must approach anti-Mormon Orientalism with great caution. To think of the Mormon question in Orientalist terms is to risk appropriating Said's concept of Orientalism to describe a horse historical process anachronistic from its intent and removed from the power dynamics of colonialism. It is to chance misrecognition of anti-Mormonism as a colonialist discourse and Mormons as unambiguously colonized subjects. In thinking about the Mormon question in Orientalist terms, I don't attempt to understand Mormons as necessarily a colonized people. That is to say, the Orientalization of Mormons did not occur solely as part of a colonialist project. Mormons were at least as much agents of the colonization of the West as they were subjects colonized by a repressive federal government. To think of them otherwise is to fail to companion the religious and ideological difference of Mormonism with its participation in the project of the colonization of the West, missing the uniqueness of the context in which anti-Mormons mobilized Orientalist tropes. Precisely where Orientalism fails as a paradigm for understanding, oh, excuse me, precisely where Orientalism helps us understand the nature of anti-Mormonism is where it fails as a paradigm for understanding the historical relations within which anti-Mormon Orientalism occurred. Nonetheless, Orientalist anti-Mormonism can only make sense within the Manichaean le legacy of colonialism that established the us and them of West and East and informed American political ideas into the 19th century. America inherited and adopted much of the legacy of European Orientalism and translated European ideas into particularly American contexts, setting Occidental America apart from the Orient it encountered in the Utah Territory. 
Like European colonialists, anti-Mormons juxtaposed an American identity against the unenlightened institutions of the Oriental East and the Mormon West. Since the Enlightenment, plural marriage functioned as one nexus upon which the cultural work of Orientalism has turned. For Orientalists, as for anti-Mormons, religion, polygamy, and political despotism were deeply entangled with one another. Links between Oriental religion, plural marriage, and the exercise of political despotism had a genealogy traceable at least back to the political thought of the Baron de Montesquieu. In his The Spirit of the Laws, Montesquieu coupled the institution of the harem to the political despotism of the, of, he saw in the East. To some extent, Montesquieu accomplished the marriage of polygamy and the enslavement of women with a rhetorical sleight of hand that substituted the term polygamy with the phrase domestic slavery. He simply assumed that one necessarily constituted the other and that all women in polygamy must, of necessity, be enslaved. That which gave rise to domestic slavery, in Montesquieu's estimation, also gave rise to political enslavement. He declared that, quote, the slavery of women is perfectly comfortable to the genius of a despotic government which delights in treating all with severity. Thus, domestic slavery and, de and despotic government walk hand in hand with an equal pace, close quote. Indeed, for Montesquieu, the very purpose of political despotism was to reconcile, quote, the political and civil administration to the domestic government, the officers of the state to those of the seraglio. In Montesquieu's analysis, the polygamous estate served not only as evidence for political despotism, but as its central metaphor as well. Despotism, in Montesquieu's analysis, feminized the policy, marking the subjects of the despot with political impotence and passivity. The despot who ruled the polity like he ruled his seraglio maintained power through, quote, the single-minded fulfillment of his desires, close quote. The arbitrariness of his will, fickle, unstable, and unrestrained, kept his subject, quote, in constant fear of violating the unknown word of the master, close quote. The political culture of the Orient was, like its harems, inherently unstable, this is according to Montesquieu, inherently unstable, disorderly, temperamental, and arbitrary, utterly dependent on the fleeting desires of one person. Thus, the subjects of the despot became analogous to the eunuchs that guarded his harem, emasculated and feminized. For Montesquieu, the twin ills of despotism and polygamy stood in contradistinction to the genius of the enlightened West. Montesquieu argued that at their best, the legal institutions of the West limited the power of political leaders. In Europe, quote, the condition of citizens is moderate, equal, mild, and agreeable. Everything, takes part, everything partakes of the benefit of public liberty. This indicated an active citizenry that operated not by fear but by reason, and the reason of the governed contained rulers' potential for despotism. Governed by reason, Europeans had no cause for the enslavement of women under polygamy, nor for the enslavement of subjects under despotism. Now, one does not have to look far to find remnants of Montesquieu's binary reasoning in anti-Mormon thought. Anti -Mormons, to anti-Mormons, Mormonism looks suspiciously like the religious, political, and, and domestic despotism with which Montesquieu characterized the cultures of the Orient, only transplanted into an American context. The Orientalist legacy of European thought has much to contribute to the study of anti-Mormonism that historians are just beginning to see. Scholarship on anti Orientalist anti-Mormonism -Mormon has, has described the process by which anti-Mormon prejudice made Mormons into a racial other. Terrell Givens argues, for example, that anti-Mormonism appropriated, quote, images of a handy, ready-made other, close quote, to make Mormons over into Asian oddity. But as more recent scholarship has pointed out, the orientalization of Mormons went beyond a simple process of racial othering to mark Mormons alongside Muslims as frauds, as Spencer Furman argues. By making Mormons oriental, anti-Mormons also clarified that to be American meant to possess liberty of conscience, conscience, to be monogamous and democratic, and to participate in the nation's racial progress. Orientalist anti-Mormons produced a means of understanding Mormonism which, while far different from Mormonism's understanding of itself, at least made the Mormon anomaly intelligible to Americans and held in place the meanings of national culture that anti-Mormons found most compelling. By showing that Mormons were really Orientals in American clothing, Orientalism made sense of the oxymoron of polygamous Americans, and by claiming that Mormons were not truly American, 
made Mormons into targets of federal law in the 1880s. Anti-Mormon apostate John C. Bennett's early work is an early example of anti-Mormon connections between polygamy and Islam in the 1840s. Bennett claimed that Joseph Smith, quote, closely resembles his master and model Muhammad in the secret relations he has formed for directing the relations of the sexes, close quote. But for Bennett, Mormon polygamy was worse than Mohammedan, such that it would appear incredible even in those licentious oriental courts of the modern Turkish and Moorish sultans. But Orientalism was not a dominant trope for understanding Mormonism until the 1850s. After Orson Pratt's 1852 announcement of plural marriage, the practice of polygamy offered anti-Mormonism a unique opportunity to move many of the assertions of earlier decades into a much more totalizing set of conclusions more firmly attached to ideologies of race and racial progress. Orientalism proved particularly useful to anti-Mormon strategies because it allowed much more of Mormonism under its tent. It could account for both polygamy and theocracy and connect those practices to the more backward races of the East. During the 1850s, in response to Pratt's disclosure, polygamy became the defining characteristic of Mormonism's un-Americanness, and Islam became a primary signifier by which Americans understood Mormonism. Anti-Mormons relied on recapitulation theory to clarify Mormon denigration, especially in political terms. Recapitulation theory in one interpretation was the widespread anthropological idea that the races of the world recapitulated human evolutionary development, that, quote, primitive societies represented cultural stages that fell short of the complete civilization exemplified by the societies of Western Europe, close quote. Recapitulation theorists argued that the races of the world each marked a stage of arrested development along the track of Anglo-European progress. Therefore, to envision the nature of, Anglo -Saxon race in, of the Anglo-Saxon race in past ages, one need only look at races in 19th century social scientists considered underdeveloped, Africans, Indians, and most popular and relevant here, Orientals. After 1852, the use of Oriental metaphors in anti-Mormonism became ubiquitous, as polygamy quickly became anti-Mormon's most central and most useful instrument. Former Territorial Court Justice John Cradlebow outlined a vision of the thing, theological similarities between Mormonism and Islam. He said that, that each, quote, preaches openly that the more wives and children its men have in this world, the purer, more influential, and conspicuous they will be in the next, that wives, children, and property will not be restored, but doubled in the resurrection. Descriptions of the, quote, customs of Constantinople practiced in the harems of the Orient of the American West and references to the Mohammedan prophets Joseph Smith and Brigham Young abounded throughout anti-Mormon literature. It was obvious to anti-Mormons that the practice of plural marriage identified Mormons with, quote, those oriental and tropical races practicing polygamy, close quote. Polygamy, they argued, quote, belongs now to the indolent and opium-eating Turks the Asiatics, the miserable Africans, and the North American savages, and the Latter-day Saints. In keeping with Montesquieuian reasoning, anti-Mormons noted the development of polygamy in the United States with much puzzlement. As one early writer noted, quote, Mormonism's doctrines and its formulas are so foreign to our dispositions and habits of thought that we should never have supposed that it would have gained a thousand proselytes among men of Anglo-Saxon blood. This writer expressed, quote, great astonishment at the progress of this wonderful people, transplanting the institutions of the mystic East into the practical and active West, uniting the voluptuous sensuality of the Oriental harem with the stern virtue and far-seeing shrewdness of the American Republic. These, we confess, are anomalies of which we cannot determine the result. Anti-Mormons feared that the introduction of the Oriental practice of plural marriage would result in the racial decline of Mormons and, by extension, the nation at large. Some Orientalist characterizations of Mormons bordered on the ridiculous. For example, one anti-Mormon contended that Salt Lake City, quote, wears a distinctly Oriental appearance. So we of the far west have only, who have only dreamed of the east imagine how Damascus may look, a dome, a tower, a spire that may answer for a minaret, a sky of more than oriental softness overhead. Now, I don't know about your experience of Salt Lake, but that's not mine. 
Um, another observed that, quote, the Mormon's handkerchief straggling from under his hat reminds one of the Bedouin kafia. The absurdity of observations like these indicates that they were not merely observations, but rather served a production function, a productive function. They made Mormons Oriental, hence un-American. Anti-Mormons were alarmed by the presence of Orientalism in the American West, and they worried that Mormons were more like the backward cultures of the Orients than the forward-looking civilization of the U.S. Anti-Mormon writer Fanny Stenhouse wrote, for example, that in Utah, quote, the teachings of Christianity have been supplanted by an attempt to imitate the barbarism of Oriental nations in a long past age. In an early article written against Utah's 1855 campaign for statehood, well-renowned political ethicist Francis Lieber declared, quote, wedlock or monogamic marriage is one of the elementary distinctions, historical and actual, between European and Asiatic humanity. Strike it out and you destroy our very being. And when we say our, we mean our race, a race which has its great and broad destiny, a solemn aim in the, right, in the great career of civilization with which none of us has any right to trifle. Yet another writer asserted that, quote, where polygamy has superseded monogamy, as in cases of conversion to Mohammedanism, there has been a decline in national character. Where monogamy has superseded polygamy, there has been a corresponding rise. These writers and others like them mobilized the language of racial progress to mark Mormons as unevolved barbarians. In this context, monogamous marriage became freighted with the entire weight of civilized progress. In anti-Mormon imaginations, what most united the backward cultures of the Orient with Mormonism was their belief in the inferiority of women. For anti-Mormonism, for anti-Mormons, it seemed apparent that only those nations who viewed women as inferior to men practiced plural marriage, and nothing showed the Orientalism of Mormonism as thoroughly as the status of women under polygamy. As anti-Mormons saw it, women under polygamy were bought and sold like cattle. Frances Willard expressed the sentiment of many anti-Mormons when she declared that, quote, Modern Mohammedanism has its mecca at Salt Lake City where Prophet Heber C. Kimball speaks of his wives as cows. In a community where women were debased as mere animals, she declared, Turkey is in our midst. Turkey, Willard declared, is, quote, is doubtless the most debased country on earth, close quote. By anti-Mormon accounts, under plural marriage, hundreds of years of the progress of civilization degenerated into a society where men, quote, oriental in their views, close quote, treated women like property. In some respects, the claim that Mormons treated their women as property was conceptually difficult, especially after Utah enfranchised women in 1871. Indeed, Mormon women voted and had more property rights, exercised greater political freedom, and possessed broader occupational freedom than many American women. But to anti-Mormons, for the most part, anti-Mormons, for the most part, endorsed the concept of marital unity as the only avenue to women's freedom. The doctrine of marital unity established that when a couple married, they became one person under the law, legally represented by the husband. As both 19th and 20th century feminists have pointed out, the doctrine of marital unity hardly established married women's freedom. Well into the 19th century, the doctrine barred women from owning property and kept them from entering contracts or accessing the, social, the, the justice system. However, many Mormon women carried no such legal disabilities because many Mormon marriages were not legally recognized. Nonetheless, for anti-Mormons, it was Mormon marriage, more than mainstream marriage, that rendered women property. Indeed, as Nancy Bentley contends, quote, polygamy is the bondage that sanctifies marriage as freedom. Juxtaposing Oriental Mormons to, ant to Americans, anti-Mormons contended unilaterally that monogamy invariably evidenced the equality, even the elevation of women, and marked the, the, marked the political progress of American civilization. The Orientalization of Mormonism went beyond marriage, however, to racialize the connections between polygamy and theocracy. In constituting the Mormons as an, Ox as an Occidental Orient, anti-Mormons embraced wholeheartedly the Montesquieuian reasoning that married polygamy to political despotism. In Utah, as in the Orient, anti-Mormons argued, polygamy gave rise to theocracy, and theocracy protected polygamy. They claimed, for example, that, quote, polygamy is one of the most odious relics of Asiatic despotism. 
and, quote, Arabian idolatry and the voluptuous paradise of the harems of the modern sultan were in anti-Mormon imaginations, quote, the result of that despotic sway of a government which, acting upon ignorance and superstition, have so greatly contributed to the political moral degradation of a powerful yet deluded portion of the posterity of Adam. As one apostate claimed, quote, imitating Muhammad in polity of government, the Mormons obtained some of the results of Muslim rule, polygamy, fanaticism, and stagnation. In response to broad anti-polygamy sentiment, Congress passed the Moral Act in 1862. The Moral Act made bigamy a crime and was targeted specifically at Mormon polygamists. However, it contained no funding for enforcement and lacked legal and evidentiary teeth, and polygamy continued unabated in Utah for nearly three more decades. Over the decades following the Moral Act, as the membership of the church increased and federal legislation proved impotent against plural marriage, anti-Mormons turned increasingly to metaphors of contagion to illustrate the magnitude of the Mormon problem. Mormonism, they argued, threatened to spread its oriental influence into the national body politic. Anti-Mormons characterized the Mormon community as a foreign nation menacing the sovereign body of America with infection. Contagion metaphors showed that Mormonism constituted a grave danger to the body politic, a danger at once bodily and political. In the mid-1870s, contagion metaphors were ubiquitous in anti- or by the mid-1870s, contagion metaphors were ubiquitous in anti-Mormon literature. Hardly a discussion of Mormon polygamy passed without comparing it to a blight, disease, cancer, ulcer, fever, scourge, miasma, or poison. No characteristic of Mormonism attracted metaphors of contagion more than plural marriage. Contagion was a particu particularly powerful trope by which to illustrate the dangers Mormonism posed to the body politic. In one of the earliest references to Mormonism as contagion, early anti-polygamy novelist Meta Victoria Fuller likened polygamy to, quote, a slow march of disease which threatens to desolate all households. She called upon the nation to declare to Utah as though to a leper, quote, away with thee and cleanse thyself. In another anti-Mormon's term, polygamy was, quote, more destructive in its effects upon the public and private relations of life than the direful inflictions of the most dreaded pestilence or natural, national, natural scourge. Another anti-Mormon claimed that polygamy, quote, is like a wasting fever, a withering miasma on the moral purpose and men mental energy of the individual man. It consumes the vitality of soul and thus effectively hinders the material progress and intellectual greatness of a people. Anti-Mormons worried that, quote, the shameful, deep, devouring, sloughing spot of corruption from its stronghold in Utah is eating away beyond the borders into neighboring communities. Indeed, the, quote, Asiatic cancer, close quote, of plural marriage, quote, is the foulest ulcer on the body of our nation, close quote. Statements like these abounded, as you can see, in anti-Mormon literature. Clearly, metaphors of contagion fulfilled important purposes for anti-Mormons. They demonstrated to an American public and to American lawmakers that the influence of Mormonism upon the nation at large must be cut off. The attempt to seal off America from, influence of, from the influence of Mormons came in the form of calls to limit Mormon political influence. Anti-Mormons believed that the Mohammedan nature of Utah's marital and political institutions had made Mormondom more like a foreign nation unto itself than a community of American citizens. According to one anti-Mormon writer, the Mormons certainly affected, quote, the, ma the manners and morals of a nation, close quote. By extension, a Mormon could not, despite any formal citizenship claim he or she might proclaim, be truly American. According to anti-Mormons, to leave the anomaly of Mormonism in place would eat at the very moorings of the American Republic. C.V. Waite declared that, quote, no community can happily exist with an institution so important as that of marriage, wanting in all those qualities that make it homogeneal with institutions and laws of neighboring civilized communities having the same object. Another writer proclaimed that, quote, either the Mormon theory of government is true in all particulars, in which case the, federals, you, the federal officials are usurpers and the Gentiles intruders and rebels against the kingdom of God, or it is false in every particular and must be totally subverted. So you can see this sort of binary reasoning. It's got to be either one or the other. 
Anti-Mormons argued that either Mormons had to conform to national norms or the nation would, one and all, become like the Mormons. Anti-Mormons thus placed Mormonism and Americanism in a Manichaean binary such that only one, Mormonism or Americanism, could survive. Coexistence was, anti-Mormons declared, impossible. With Mormonism within it, there could be no true America. Perhaps the most damning statement connecting polygamy and theocracy to the Orient was the Supreme Court decision in the Reynolds case of 1879 that upheld the constitutionality of anti-polygamy legislation in secret into the 20th century. And the church began to, quote, Americanize its politics over the turn of the century. Orientalist anti-Mormonism was one of the most important rhetorical forces that drove the Americanization of Mormons at the turn of the, Mormonism at the turn of the century. Orientalism lent strength to Mormonism's opponents and one of the nation's most profound marital alternatives faded in 1890 in no small part because of its political and rhetorical force. Thank you. Um, I found, Christine, your presentation absolutely fascinating, and you spent a lot of time talking about the anti-Mormon, um, the things that were being written, kind of, and bringing the issue to light for the, the general American public. I'm just curious, I am familiar with wife number 19, and, when, you know, and I'm, I'm wondering how that affected, how much of it was external, and then how the internal um, opposition to polygamy then aided kind of the sentiment of the public that you already kind of addressed in your presentation. Sorry, you, does that make any sense? Can you, can you clarify the last part? Yes, well I'm just wondering what the relationship was between the external criticism of polygamy that you mainly addressed in your paper and, and how internal kind of, um, particularly wife number 19, things that were written like unto that kind of enhanced um, the, the, the country's reaction to um, the polygamy that was, uh, what, what the women's voice themselves, how that aided, because you, you talk a lot about, you know, observations. I'm just wondering what the women's, the primary source, how that aided in that. Yeah, one of the things I think um, that happened is there, there were, there were s some women who um, sort of disavowed themselves of polygamy and became anti-polygamist writers and wrote novels and books like one, one that one's called Wife Number 19. And um, one of the things that I think that did was a well, a couple of things happen, one of which is that even they borrow heavily from anti-Mormon rhetoric. I mean, there's not much of a sort of rhetorical difference in the ways that apostate Mormon, both men and women really, in the ways that both apostate men and Mormon men and women talk about Mormonism. And so they borrow heavily from anti-Mormon rhetoric in really interesting ways. Um, but the second thing that I think that that does is when you have sort of apostate Mormons who are making the same kinds of claims that anti-Mormons are making, um, or that non-Mormon anti-Mormons are making, it really sort of lends a certain kind of credibility to those claims. So I think there's a way that because, um, I'll say, sort of Mormon apostate anti-Mormons borrowed as heavily as they did from um, sort of non-apostate anti-Mormons, <laughs> um, because they borrowed as heavily as they did, it really lent credence to some of the things that anti-Mormons were saying, which is interesting, I think. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm, I was just wondering, you talked a lot about uh, the history. Do you see, like, it seems in modern times that polygamy has kind of had a resurgence of interest in the fundamentalist Mormons. Do you see any trends in, like, the non-Mormons viewing the polygamists now as uh, Oriental? Or do you see trends in, like, regular, like, LDS Mormons viewing the fundamentalist Mormons in terms of Oriental? Um, I don't have a lot of experience reading contemporary anti-polygamy literature, but, I, but in, in the experience that I do have, I haven't seen the same kinds of Orientalist trends. 
But what's really interesting to me is I see the same kinds of narratives happening over and over and over, except the guy comes in a car instead of on a horse. Um, and I'm not really sure what's going on there, because it, it, it's very interesting to me that, that the stories are so very similar and that the tropes are so very similar. Um, but no, I don't see the same kind of orientalization. I think there's been sort of a, a, steer, clear, a, a steer away from that particular way, because it's, it's, it's rooted so much in this sort of 19th century racialist view of sort of the backwardness of orientalist cultures and the, and the kind of um, sort of superiority of the West. And I think we've gotten away from that enough that it doesn't quite have the same rhetorical force that it did in the 19th century. But I'm very interested in one of the one of the things that's sort of on my plate is to think about doing a research project about contemporary anti-polygamy novels because those tropes are so similar. And I don't know what to make of that yet. Um, you have my head spinning. Uh, <laughs> that was my intent. Yes. Can you talk slower, move your lips, and explain to me? I, I liked what you said, but in contemporary anti Mormonism, I don't see a handle coming from the late 1800s through the 1900s to the current evangelical anti Mormonism. What's their handle? What are they grabbing onto? Is it past polygamy? Is it, I mean, this Orientalism of putting Joseph Smith and Muhammad in the same basket because they both had a vision and they both brought out a book. Mm -hmm. Then there's the polygamy and then there's the second class women issue. I don't see any of those playing a role. I see it more the Godhead with the contemporary evangelical types. Is there more to it than the evangelical argument? That's a difficult question for me to answer. Um, I'm not an expert on contemporary anti-Mormonism, but I think, I think there is some sort of discussion of the historical um, practice of polygamy, which is to say that there is um, people, anti-Mormon, contemporary anti-Mormon discourse talks a lot about the sort of historical practice of polygamy and that there's some, some sort of problem with that um, historically. But I think my sense is that the handle is really about the Godhead stuff that, that, that Mormons believe that, that um, the Godhead is three separate personages and that there's this sort of evangelical commitment to um, a more sort of Trinitarian interpretation. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's sort of the best I can probably do. 